Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Justin Davis. Um, I'm a PM on the AKS team. Um, yeah, as George said, the announcement with Carpenter today, that's one of the things that I was working on, so we're very, very happy about that. The, just to let you know, the public GitHub repo should be available later on today or tomorrow morning. We're just getting through the uh, procedural stuff to be able to make that open source. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about AI and ML innovation on Kubernetes and AKS. Um, I'll be taking on the first half of the presentation. Amanda, sitting over here, will be taking over the second half of the presentation. So we'll have a quick uh, changeover. So really what we're going to be talking about is running AI workloads on AKS, why it's there, why you know, AI, AI is important. I think we all know why AI is important, but I'll give you, give you some context and background. And then Amanda will be going on and talking about how we can use AI to be able to make running AKS and Kubernetes workloads much, much simpler for you as well. So AI has been around since the 1950s. Um, and it really came down to you, know, you shove data into a computer or you do statistical modeling. Um, and you can get some really interesting things. The problem about AI workloads and, and AI in general is that the realization of that didn't happen until a few years ago. And the reason for that is, is that you put data in and use statistical models, it doesn't really generalize very well. And so as we moved on to 2021, and sorry, uh, 2017, where you had these deep learning models, so things that could basically decide, is there a cat in this picture or is there a dog in this picture? Very, very useful, as you can imagine. Um, but what happened was, is with that, those deep learning models, how they actually got created was taken to another level with generative AI. Because we could start working on huge amounts of data to be able to actually get something which could generalize and what has now turned into large language models, which is really what OpenAI managed to drive. And you can see with a lot, lot of other open source models are now following the same type of, of scenarios where you throw just infinite amount, feels like infinite amounts of data at, at the problem to be able to generalize on basically understanding not just language and how to interact with language, but actually using a corpus of, of information and data to be able to actually reason upon that as well. And that's kind of where we are with, with the AI landscape at the moment. Everyone's used ChatGPT. If you've ever copied and pasted code or used uh, Copilot, for example, or pasted a PDF document into ChatGPT and said, extract some information for, for, for me, you actually find that that's really, really good. It's very, very good at understanding, generalizing, and pulling data out as well. And so two years ago, I think it was, or 18 months ago when I was on this stage, I was talking about basically software development, OK? You know, how do you, how do you fail fast? How do you develop a minimal viable product? And thinking about how Kubernetes is really good for those types of situations. How can your engineering team develop an application, deploy it, iterate, and just move quicker? And the thing is, is that AI is now starting to change that model of being constrained in terms of your, you, you're doing your application development. So what APIs am I calling? What components am I integrating into? You can now think about AI and say, well, how can I infuse AI and the, what it can do for me and the power that it can give me into my applications? And so you can start thinking not only about software development life cycles, but the integration of my AI models in terms of making my application better going forward. And so generative AI takes you from that static box of developing an application which is constrained by the APIs that it can call and actually is a paradigm shift over to not having to have structured data anymore. You know, copying and pasting that PDF or helping me write a resume, which obviously I'm not gonna, hap not gonna happen. I love working at Microsoft, but it can help me do all of those things to be able to just move further than I could do by being constrained by me doing software development. And it's data driven as well. The data that I can put into an AI model and inference from that AI model can help me be able to drive business value much, much quicker. And so, again, 18 months ago, I would have been standing here and basically saying, you know, your application should be sitting on Kubernetes, and of course, they should be sitting on AKS as well to allow you to be able to drive, that, drive innovation and drive business value much, much quicker. And the same thing can be applied onto the AI world as well. You develop your applications, but you integrate into AI models. And so, looking at the ecosystem that we have, 
it's, it's the same ecosystem. I mean, you still have Cosmos DB, you still have identity management, you still have Kubernetes, you still have uh, load testing, you still have GitHub, you still have code spaces. All of those tools to be able to allow you to be able to drive that innovation much, much quicker is still there. But the great thing is, I'm just trying to figure this out now, top right hand corner, you can now integrate to Azure ML services. You can integrate into the OpenAI public SDK as well. And you can start using machine learning and generating your own models based on your data within Azure. Not to oversimplify this, it is just an integration point. That's, that's one of the things that we look at in Azure is that we have a powerful service over, over here. My application should be able to call it. And it's just you know, with a shared key and with an, an API endpoint, I'm there and I have my full integration ready to be able to go. Just because it's AI, just because it's very, very exciting in terms of what it can do, we're still making it as simple as possible for you to be able to integrate into. And so if we look at why AI and why now, I think back in the 1990s, everyone was saying that data is the new oil. And what they mean by that is that corporations, large corporations, small, cor small companies, you know, everything that you have in terms of customer relationship management, everything you have in terms of people buying and selling uh, through you, all the information that you have about people who you're, you're employing within your organization, that's all data. And traditionally, what you'd have to do was to put that data into a structured format so that you could basically uh, do ETLs on it you, that, so that you could basically start looking up information and start doing large table joins, all very, very boring things. But now with all of the large language models out there, you can take the data that you have in your data lake or in a SQL database, and you can start integrating that into these large language models. And LLMs are remarkable in terms of, of reasoning over data, both old data that it was trained on, but new data because it understands language and in different languages to be able to look at information and say, give me out of this long piece of text, give me this sentient information that I need to be able to make a business decision. The issue that you used to have with, with deep learning models as well was that they were considered to be black boxes. What you put in and what you got out was actually very difficult to understand why and how it was reasoning over that information. Both Microsoft and OpenAI have worked really, really hard to be able to just say, okay, how have you come to this decision? Because if a corporation or an enterprise is depending on a large language model to be able to make a decision based on data, you sure as hell want to know why it made that decision in the first place as well. So understanding where that data came from and how it's, how it's basically reasoned over it is really, really important. And those checks and balances are there now. The, the, the way that we actually do that is there and is built in. And that the final part of this is that the, your phone's just there. Um, the really important part of this is patterns and practices are in place now. Large language models have only been around for around about six to nine months, but how you actually use them, how you use things like vector databases to be able to just take your own data and reason over that is there and is well established. Not just by Microsoft and OpenAI, but the open source community has built all of these patterns and practices up with things like Llama Index that allows you just to be able to go from zero to 100% in a couple of hours and using the power of AI to be able to do that. One of the challenges that you have, and anyone really has when they're generating these types of large language models, is that it's actually really difficult. Like you have to source terabytes of data. You have to be able to scale the model generation to an eye-watering amount. You have to use GPUs. You may use InfiniBand for low latency backend to be able to make a supercomputer. All of these things are actually very difficult and are incremental steps to be able to get to the point of how you actually generate these large language models. And so why AKS for AI uh, workloads? The end-to-end -end integration, like I, like I talked about previously, is there. You know, Kubernetes, not to diminish it, Kubernetes is a compute platform. It's a very good compute platform. It allows you to basically not think about the infrastructure. And that's a really important part about when you're generating these large language models is that you don't want to have to think about what CPUs do I need? What, memories do I, what memory do I need? How do I provision a GPU uh, node to be able to run my model generation? Kubernetes, and specifically AKS running on Azure, deals with all of that for you. It takes around about 50% of the heartache of spinning up the infrastructure to be able to generate these large language models. And 
if you think about how you generate these models, it's all batch-based processing. You know, generating models and weights is basically taking a lot of data and iterating through epochs to be able to generate um, your large language model or any type of model that you're doing. But you have tens or hundreds of these running and basically generating these models over time. That's a Kubernetes job. Like, it's that simple. It's, if I have the infrastructure and I, I have a quota available for me to be able to run uh, my worker uh, instances, it's really, really simple just to be able to say, just run a thousand jobs and do it within the infrastructure that I want. That's a Kubernetes paradigm there. And of course, we're really proud of the work that we've done in terms of lighting up GPU SKUs, both A100s and H100s, as well as the fact that Azure is, yes, Uh, I'm coming on to that, um, but I think there are different situations. So the, the question was, oh, am I suggesting that you should be running large language models on AKS? It's not applicable to everybody. Like, you could just spin up an OpenAI instance on Azure or integrate with the external uh, ChatGPT uh, API itself, and if that's good enough for what you want to do, which it probably likely will be, then just stay with that model because you don't want to go and all of the things that I just talked about, you don't want to have to do that. We'll talk in terms of why customers may want to go to that extra step of actually generating their models themselves or using um, open source models which are hosted within AKS as well. So I talked about before causality and the safety, you know, the, the whole idea that the black box is kind of goes away now and the applicability of these large language models to make business decisions based on the data that you put into them is kind of there and, it, and is safe for you to be able to use. Um, how to apply AI to your model is challenging. If anyone's ever put in a prompt into ChatGPT and said, you know, give me a great recipe for, uh, I don't know, hollandaise sauce, for example, you can say uh, that's, that's a prompt that you're basically putting in there. But then you may say, well, yeah, that's a great answer. It's got a really good uh, recipe for me, but actually I want to spice it up a little bit. So you'll go back and you'll iterate over your prompt to be able to say, I want you to give me the data, but specifically this type of data. That's called prompt engineering. And you, even when you're integrating with large language models, you will need to iterate and figure out what those prompts are going to be. Much like the same way that you'd have a developer in a loop when you're developing your minimal viable product, you'll have an AI in a loop where you're designing what your prompts look like as well. And so starting off with the OpenAI API allows you to be able to do that and say, this is the perfect prompt over this data which I'm ingesting for me to be able to get the right business decision out of it as well. And so it's that shift in terms of how you're looking at integrating AI. So, as George said, OpenAI uses uh, AKS, but also uh, Bing, uh, the Microsoft Office as well, if anyone's ever used Teams and has had a nice uh, catch up with your team, at the end of that meeting, you can basically go to Insights and it'll tell you uh, the summarization of that meeting, as well as action and insights that need to basically follow up after that as well. That's using OpenAI models and they're running on AKS. And so running those models from an inferencing point of view, you know, an open AI model or any type of large language model being hosted on a Kubernetes uh, cluster is an application endpoint. It's a service endpoint. There's nothing more complex about it than, than that. How you stitch all of those things together and serve up that model can be quite tricky, which we'll talk about later. And so the applicability of AI and machine learning as well, if we look at the MBA, they have huge amounts of data and telemetry which is coming in from the games and looking in terms of what insights they can gather for that to be able to actually extract from that data stream is really, really important for them. And so they've taken this idea of using AI to add business value on top of the data that they're generating game by game. And so thinking about how you can do that for your organization and for the applications that you have really takes a little bit of just thinking outside of the box. It's like we have this data. Can we get further insights to be able to drive further business value? You probably can but you've got to think about what data that is and what we're trying to get out of that data as well. And so coming back to the point that you made, why would I run large language models in AKS? You don't need to. Uh, Brian and the team, Brian's sitting at the back somewhere, 
um, basically put together a demo application, which is uh, a couple of different components, whereby it will go and integrate into OpenAI and uh, OpenAI models on Azure ML to be able to just run a traditional application. But what they've done is just built in the integration to OpenAI on top of that to make that application a lot smarter and a lot cleverer in terms of what it does. It takes away the manual steps of basically describing what uh, you have in your shopping basket or, or on the, the store which you can basically put orders into and is all fully integrated. And so it shows you what those design, designs and patterns are to be able to do that type of integration. So we go to aka.ms slash aks slash OAI. I could have come up with a better URL for that, but the demo application is there and can be pulled down on GitHub to be able to see how we do that. And then finally, because we're just throwing lots of different options at you, the uh, Azure Machine Learning Anywhere initiative allows you to be able to run AML models on AKS, and on AKS or on an on-premise Kubernetes cluster as well. So you know, taking the power of what we have with uh, uh, Azure ML uh, Studio to, for you to be able to deploy those onto your Kubernetes clusters is there as well. So I'd recommend looking at that in terms of the different types of options that you have, both with integrating with OpenAI um, as well as kind of taking it to the next level and building those in yourself. And then finally, going to what I would consider to be hardcore AI. Um, and that's really where we start thinking about you're an organization and you want to generate your own large language models or you want to be able to generate, uh, generate models which allow you to be able to do text-to-speech, for example. You really need to start thinking about what does that framework look like and how can you basically build all of these things together. And so AI is made up of two things. One is the model generation. Two is inferencing. So model generation is literally starting from either an existing model or generating your own AI model based on data that you're feeding into it. Once you have that model generated, you need to serve it up. You need to serve it up as an, as an API, and that's what we class as being inferencing. You're hosting your model to be able to actually get value back from it. And so, when you think about building all of those things together, there are not just open AI models. There may be reasons that you will basically want to generate your own models based on data which is specific to you, not general purpose, but things that are specific to your use cases. And so you need to have that choice, which you do. There are lots of open AI, uh, sorry, lots of large language models available as open source now, but you may choose that you want to basically to develop your own as well. And so, a large language model is just a model and its weights, but you then need to build the integration around that as well. So whether that's just a simple Python Flask API to then go and load your model and then basically spit out some feedback for you, or like I said, using something like Llama Index to basically go you know, in, with an inbuilt vector store for you to be able to then start uh, looking at, at what you're sending over to your model, you can do all of that as well there are a plethora of choices for you to be able to how you actually set those things up. And this becomes quite complicated very, very quickly. You've got your model or you've got an open source model. How am I going to be able to serve that up? And then finally, the choice in terms of hosting your own large language model in AKS or generating your own could simply be down to, I have data which is only mine and I don't want it outside of my organization. And so how do you think about using that information so that you have complete control over the model, but also the data which is in there as well. So when we look at model generation, the really the steps that you have on the left-hand side um, is to, first of all, get the data that you actually want to make the model from. So you have to stage and transform that data. You have to clean that data up and get it into a use, usable form to be able to actually start generating a, a model. You need to load the weights. If it's an existing model, some of these models can be 10, 20, 100, 200 gigabytes in size. They can be absolutely enormous. And so you need to be able to host those models somewhere as well. And then you go through training to be able to actually build up, look at the data, test the data, test the model to be able to see whether it's actually giving you the value that you need and whether you think it's at a good point to be, be a publishable model. And you test it and then you checkpoint it. And then the, the process just goes round and round in circles until you basically want to be able to generate a model. Um, I think the Llama model from Facebook, I think it was literally two weeks of, of just GPU action happening for a complete two weeks to be able to generate the model that they actually released. It takes a long time to be able to actually get these models generated, but all of that can be batch processed, like I said. You may have a 1,000 epochs that you're running over, and you may have 
10,000 worker jobs which are actually going and crunching through that data. This fits really well in terms of sitting on a Kubernetes cluster because it's job-based. So as I said, job-based, you're probably gonna need a GPU. You can generate a large language model on CPUs, but come back to me next KubeCon once that's actually finished versus doing it on you know, GPU infrastructure itself. Um, I've talked about InfiniBand quite a lot. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that we are basically the only cloud provider that has InfiniBand. Um, yes, we are, um, that has InfiniBand. InfiniBand is basically a low latency uh, network interface, very, very low latency. And if you imagine having, let's say, 100 nodes, GPU nodes, and they're all on InfiniBand, it's, it's called RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access. I can access the memory of another node and the memory of another GPU as if it was basically part of the same machine. And so you can literally stitch together a supercomputer with GPUs and InfiniBand. Oh, and by the way, you can do that on AKS as well, and it will just do it for you. You don't have to plumb this stuff in. Nearly everything that you're doing with these as well, with checkpointing, loading data up to be able to generate these large language models, my goodness, is it disk intensive. So you're gonna to need to have things start thinking about SSD, ultra SSD, blob storage. Where am I gonna load all of my unstructured data from? Probably blob storage. Where am I gonna load my transactional data from? Probably Cosmos DB. As I talked about on the slide at the beginning, all of those Azure services that can host all of this data for you, all of these Azure services that can do ETL jobs for you as well automatically, you can integrate to all of these, but your jobs can be running on AKS. So Microsoft and Azure takes care of an awful lot of this for you. And then finally with inferencing, like I said before, inferencing is basically loading a model with an API endpoint. That's, an, that's a Kubernetes service right there. Very, very simple to be able to deploy. And even better, if you have workloads which are coming into, the, into these endpoints and you need to scale it from one to 10 to 100, you can do that. It's a Kubernetes scale operation. We'll take care of the rest of it for you pick the correct SKUs and load those up for you. So George talked about the artifact streaming. Um, to say that's a game changer, especially when it comes to AI workloads, is an understatement. The fact that you can basically get, George, how big was that, how big was that container image? 30 gigs? 30 gigs. So that's a small, large language model. But the fact that you can spin that up in six seconds using artifact streaming allows you to basically scale very, very quickly when you're hosting these models. Um, and for people that are wedded to using ML workloads and generating ML workloads on Windows as well, uh, Ali is working on lighting up GPU support in AKS, um, which will allow you to be able to run those workloads on Windows if you want to as well. So I'm gonna be handing over to Amanda soon, but there's just a couple of things that I just wanna to show to you uh, before we go. Um, the current user experience, like I said, is, is quite complicated. We, AKS and Azure can take you quite a way there to be able to start hosting these models, um, but you still need to think, figure out how am I gonna host it? How am I gonna deploy it? How am I going to scale it? Uh, what GPU infrastructure do I need to be able to deploy these models? Um, you still have to make those decisions because it's you which is running it and it may be a model which, which you've designed yourself. And so it's quite disjointed, and really what you wanna do is try and make that as easy as possible for you. And so today we're announcing Cato, which is the Kubernetes AI, what's the T stand for? Thank you, toolchain operator. Um, and so what that is, is basically an operator which allows you to deploy these applications, to take all of the disjointed aspects that I talked about previously and basically deploy and run and host a model for you with very little overhead from you. So I'm gonna finish off with a demo of this. I'll just walk through it as well. But we're really, really pleased in terms of the announcement of this today. So let's hit this. So, so here we have a workspace definition, a Cato workspace definition. And we're basically saying that the instance type or the, the VM that we're choosing, as well as then the large language model that we're actually going to be deploying. I don't have to worry about my node pool selection or anything else like that. I'm just basically saying, this is the instance type, this is the model that I want to be able to uh, deploy. So we just have a look at the services after that model's been deployed now. I'll give it a second. So the workspace is ready. And we've got an endpoint which has been deployed on the cluster IP address. 
So now I'm just going to run a curl command for me to basically go and start talking to that large language model. So we're asking, what is KubeCon? And what's happened here in the background is my workspace has been spun up, my GPU instance has been deployed, I've automatically pulled down a large language model, and now I'm inferencing against it straight off. At no point have I had to do any of that building blocks stuff that I was talking about previously. It's all done for you. We're going to be building on Kato to be able to support more language models, as well as uh, image models, audio models as well, where we can pull those open source models down for you. We will also allow customers to be able to host their own models so that they can actually do that deployment. So all of the uh, boilerplate that you would have to spin up for this in terms of how you're actually deploying these models is done for you. And so we're trying to close that loop to make it as simple as possible. Let's see. OK, so I'm going to hand over to Amanda now, who's going to talk to you more about how we can apply AI in terms of running uh, AKS and AKS workloads. Over to you. Thank you, Justin. Next, I'll be discussing how AI can help to make the end-to-end -end AKS experience better. We're all aware that Kubernetes can be complex. There are several Kubernetes components that work together to provide an interface that allows you to define and manage your applications. And this gives you a high degree of flexibility and reliability. But managing these components can be challenging. Managed Kubernetes service, such as AKS, can handle some of the complexity for you, from multi-layer security best practices to tooling to help improve your developer productivity to day to operations that helps with automated upgrades and patches and many more. But managed Kubernetes is just a starting point. There are still things that need to be considered and decisions that need to be made based off your organization's and application's needs. Things like security. Are multiple teams going to be sharing in the same cluster? How do we deal with access control? Developing toolings. Will there be a dedicated operations team to help the developers manage the clusters? Or will the developers have to manage on their own in, in addition to developing applications? And other aspects like platform management, DevOps, and security. So there's still some unresolved problems today. Kubernetes itself is very flexible and highly customizable. No one solution fits all when it comes to adopting Kubernetes. So it's up to the organization to decide what approach best fits them and their application's needs. This could seem <coughs> overwhelming to new companies that are looking to adopt Kubernetes or even existing Kubernetes users. Uh, that are now changing application needs or deploying new applications. Next, the sheer breadth and depth of Kubernetes can also be a big learning curve. Deciding on which scaling methods to use, uh, how to approach networking design, or uh, what open source projects to adopt, these are all decisions that need to be made, which goes hand in hand with hiring. Hiring people with Kubernetes experience or previous knowledge is really essential to help your company accelerate your Kubernetes adoption. But in the current economy, hiring can be difficult. Um, and training is very important as well. So not only ramping up your existing employees, but also uh, new employees that you have just hired about Kubernetes and your organization's approach to developing on Kubernetes. So how can AI help with all of these problems? First, the AI assistant is available 24-7. It can quickly answer any questions that you may have um, as a buddy you know, uh, to help you address any scenarios. And next, it can also help answer questions from a wide variety, ranging from basic Kubernetes concepts to networking design to writing a YAML uh, to be more productive as a developer. It can also help you generate command line scripts to help create and update AKS resources based off a set of scenarios and requirements that you might have for your application. There's no need to dig through the documentations or API specs to find out what feature you need to enable or what is the right command to use. And all of this is backed by the latest AKS docs to return up-to-date answers about new features that we release or guidances that we publish. So we look at the AKS customer journey in three scenarios. The first scenario here is kind of the day zero scenario around uh, learning about Kubernetes and AKS, getting started, perhaps in de developing your first uh, 
application on Kubernetes and creating that first cluster. Let's look at a demo here. Here we're in the CLI AI tool, and I want to ask it a simple question like deploying a web app and expose it to the public. So the very simple day zero getting started scenario. We can see that it's populating with um, a script to create a resource group, an AKS cluster, and also getting that credential for that cluster while deploying a uh, deployment for a sing simple Nginx image and exposing that to the internet. Uh, the tool also does a summary of uh, what the script means and a detailed explanation of what's going on. And then you can choose to reprompt the tool uh, to update some environment variables here or also just update part of the scripts. So here we're updating some of the environment variables. You can see the script is being repopulated and uh, updated with those environment variables while keeping contact of what, what was previously generated. Now the script looks good, we'll run it. And as you can see, it quickly populates um, the results from the API with the cluster being created successfully. And we'll merge in the context to that uh, Kubernetes cluster. And then I'll do another prompt to ask it, how can I get the public IP address to this web application? It recognizes uh, the kubectl get service is the right command to use, and I'll run that command as well. You can see the external IP is now available, and we'll do a curl command at that IP to see that the internet X image is up and running. Next, we'll look at a slightly more advanced scenarios. In this scenario, I want to be doing some batch te testing for my GPU workload. So in the prompt, I mentioned that I will be doing some batch processing and the workload can burst at times. The AI recognizes this and is able to create a cluster with autoscaler enabled based off the word burst. And it also uses a GPU node as the VM size. Um, I'm gonna reprompt it because I'm also going to run regular workloads in addition to the GPU workloads. So now uh, we can see the CL again is in place updating uh, to create a normal SKU and then adding a GPU node pool in addition to that node pool uh, with cluster autoscaler enabled. Then I'm just going to do some update to my environment variables. I'll speed through here a little bit. and up, also updating the node pool count. And then the script looks good, so we'll now run it. We can see the cluster being successfully created. Now I wanna be doing some testing. So I asked it to give me some idea around what demo I can run to test if the cluster is working as intended. It creates a Docker image for me and the script that's used to do that calculation, as well as a YAML file with the ability to insert your own Docker image. Um, this is a little bit advanced right now for me. Uh, maybe I want to be able to do some testing without building my own Docker image, so I also asked the AI how to help. It's generating a simple job for me to be able to uh, do some testing, running that five times. Well, you ask it to update it to bash so we can run that job. Okay, now that job has finished running, we'll ask how to check the status and the results. It gives us some kubectl commands to be able to check the statuses. and we can see that the job that was created has successfully com completed. And then we'll check about the resource health of this cluster. Um,
Here we're using the get nodes command and get pods command. And once this executes, we'll see that the node has, is still uh, running successfully and one of the pod had just completed with the job running on it. Okay, and the next scenario we'll look at is around day one. After doing some simple testing, uh, how do we understand all the best practices for our AKS clusters and get our workloads ready for production? Yeah, question. The, the reason I'm asking you is due to tomorrow we're going to have a knowledge uh, cutoff point of January 2022, right? So how are you doing to update? Yeah, so the question was around. Um, Earlier I mentioned that it always um, return up-to-date information and the uh, gentleman here asked about the cutoff point for GPT around 2021. So we are aware of that and uh, since 2021 we're basically uh, manually updating all of the information from our Azure docs to fill in that gap. Yeah, so uh, then around day one uh, best practices and getting to production, let's look at some demos. So previously we have been doing some batch testing. Uh, now let's look at AKS Intelligent Assistant in the portal. There's some uh, pre-generated questions that you can choose uh, to ask, but you can also ask your own questions. Um, I'm curious about batch processing and what are the best practices I should follow. So I asked the Intelligent Assistant this question. As you can see, it quickly returns a set of best practices that you can follow. Uh, there are things like VM SKUs, choosing managed disk size, and many more. Uh, we have a question uh, that, to follow up on uh, how to select the managed disk size. So we can quickly ask that question. And as you can see, now it explains uh, different disk options, both in the standard, standard and premium tiers, as well as some considerations that you may have when choosing uh, the, the disk size for your workload. And then if we scroll up to the first question, there was also another recommendation about turning off your workloads, especially these kind of intensive uh, batch processing workload. Um, I'm, I don't need to run it all the time, so I want to understand what is the node pool start and stop feature that was previously mentioned. Here we can see that uh, there's two commands that you can use, uh, starting the node pool and stopping the node pool. So now I'm aware of this great feature that can help me save cost. Um, on the same note, I'm curious about other ways to save costs. And again, it gives us a list of recommendations on uh, choosing appropriate SKUs, uh, both for the VM size and managed disk, as well as other recommendations. If I had additional questions, all of this uh, has links cited uh, to our Azure Docs. So we can open up uh, our article on optimizing cost and learn more there. <coughs> Another uh, common set of questions around getting started is uh, understanding which Azure Container Registry you can use, especially when developing multiple applications or uh, uh, working with multiple teams. So in this scenario, we check that uh, if we have access to a specific Azure Container Registry uh, from our AKS cluster. So by asking a simple question in uh, the assistant, we can now see that the Canapo project is deployed into the node. And uh, we can either copy paste the command that's below or click the run command button and we can see that command was populated automatically, and we can click Run. And we can see success, we can pull image from that container registry.
then the last set of scenarios here is around day two operations, both monitoring, troubleshooting, and also uh, doing upgrades to your Kubernetes control plane and nodes. Here we'll look at the monitoring scenario. Um, I want to be, get some help to collect some diagnos diagnostics logs for my AKS cluster. So I can either have the option to deploy a default AKS periscope or uh, my own periscope container. We'll choose the first one here. And as the periscope container is deployed, we can either click the two blue links on the right-hand side uh, to click in to see those logs, or we can go to uh, the portal blade and go to con container insights, diagnostics settings, and click in. And let's refresh. Now we can see the AKS Periscope container is deployed. Uh, we go inside and see um, the nodes itself and then look at the cloud init log. So here we are looking for any potential issues when the cluster was created. And we can dig in through those logs to see uh, if there are any issues uh, that we weren't able to find, find before. And in the future, we're also working on smart intelligence to be able to sort through these logs and create insights for you. Um, the last set of scenarios we'll look at is around upgrade. Uh, I want to understand what is my current, what is the current version that my cluster is running on and what I can upgrade to. So as you can see, the assistant have generated some CLI commands and I can paste right into the cloud shell to get the response. I'm currently running a 1.26 cluster. Again, I ask it for, um, I get the script for what other versions I can upgrade to. And we can see there are two 1.27 available. And when we're considering upgrading, uh, I want to do it at a time where uh, the traffic is low, so I was wondering if there's anything I can do to help with that. And uh, the assistant returns some answers. One, we can use the plant maintenance window, which allows you to configure a window where your traffic is low to do that upgrade, to have minimum disruption. Uh, along with that, we can also use max surge uh, to make sure the upgrade is fast and smooth. Um, and then the last thing we can enable is pod disruption back budgets. And we can see uh, the assistant is able to also summarize this for us. Uh, in addition to upgrading my cluster, I also want to make sure that my node images are patched. Um, so I ask, is there a way to do that? Uh, it returns with this nice feature uh, around an auto upgrade channel, uh, selecting the node image channel, uh, which allows you to automatically patch your node image with uh, new updates. Um, this is the first time I've heard about upgrade channels, so I'm also curious about other upgrade channels that are available. So I asked the assistant what to do. And the assistant here returns five uh, additional upgrade channels that are available for me to pick from. Uh, right now, I'm on 1.26, which is still in support, so I'm curious about uh, when I need to make that next upgrade. Uh, so here we see that generally uh, each version is maintained uh, for about three months or so, uh, while there's something called long-term support that allows you to stay on a Kubernetes version for two years. This is super cool. I've never heard of it before. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. So what is long-term support and would I be a good fit to use it? Again, it gives you a little bit more insights uh, about long-term support and uh, the kind of clientele that's best fit for. It's for people who want more control when migrating from one containers, one version to another version. Okay, a quick recap. So AI is in a new era, and it's truly revolutionizing we think about apps, and a lot of companies are seeding this opportunity to innovate. 
Kubernetes and Cloud Native still remains the platform and the ecosystem that allows companies to go through with this faster innovation. And AKS platform offers a variety of features to support you running AI and machine learning workloads from InfiniBand to uh, Artifact Streaming to Kaito. And with all of the help of, from AI, it can help new and existing users navigate the learning curve and keep up with new developments in this space. Thank you.